Welcome to the fourth episode in our Bench to Bedside webinar series titled From Biomarker to Surrogate. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel next week. If you would like to ask something during the webinar, please use the question box to submit your questions and we will come back to these at the end. Joining us to present today's webinar is Dr. Penny Ward. Penny has over 20 years experience in clinical development and medical affairs, and her work has contributed to the approval of numerous therapies for the treatment of infectious diseases, osteoporosis, and autoimmune disorders in the US, EU, and Japan. Penny, I will now hand over to you. Thank you, Georgina. Well, welcome everybody to this fourth in the series of Bench to Bedside seminars. And today I'm going to be spending time talking about biomarkers and how to turn these eventually into a surrogate marker for clinical development. Uh, I'm going to follow this outline. Uh, I'm going to talk about the definitions of biomarker, which largely depend on the use to which that biomarker will be put and I will give a range of examples of each type. I'll then go on to discuss uh, in particular the US requirements for biomarker development and uh, qualification as these would be critical for any uh, development program that is seeking to uh, use these in the US. Uh, the European guidelines are closely mirroring those of the US and so uh, what uh, is done for uh, the FDA is equally important for the European authorities. And lastly, I will talk about the uh, development of a surrogate marker, that is uh, a marker which is intended to enable registration of a compound in place of a clinical outcome in uh, clinical development, and uh, give an example of uh, how that was done in the past. So firstly, what is a biomarker? Well, this definition was taken from the National Institutes of Health Biomarker Definitions Working Group, uh, which started out in 2001 and remains current. And a biomarker is defined as any characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of either a bi normal biological process, a pathogenic uh, process, or that assesses a pharmacologic response to a therapeutic intervention. Now, this can cover a range of technologies, and as we will see when I go through the definitions, indeed, a range of uh, approaches can be classified as biomarkers and uh, utilized uh, in, for uh, the purposes mentioned. So what is a biomarker? Well, firstly, uh, a biomarker can be used to detect a disease or to confirm its presence or to characterize a subtype of uh, patients within the disease of interest. And if used in that way, the biomarker is said to be a diagnostic biomarker. It can be used to identify the likelihood of a clinical event occurring at some uh, defined time point or of the risk of progression in patients with the disease of, of interest uh, under study, in which case it would be called a prognostic biomarker. It can be used to assess the safety of an intervention or of an environmental exposure, in which case it's a safety biomarker. It can be used to assess the response within a subject to an intervention, in which case it may be termed a pharmacodynamic or a response biomarker. It can be used to identify individuals who are more likely to respond or alternatively to fail to respond to a specific intervention. And in this usage is referred to as a predictive biomarker. And lastly, it can be used as a surrogate for a clinical outcome, in which case it may be referred to as a surrogate marker. Uh, for that disease. So let's turn to some examples. Um, to remind you, a diagnostic biomarker is something that will detect or confirm the presence of a disease or to identify individuals with a specific disease subtype. And there are many types of 
of uh, approaches that can be used to do this. And some examples would include the measurement of blood sugar or of hemoglobin A1c, uh, which is used commonly as a diagnostic biomarker to identify patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. It can be repeated blood pressure readings obtained outside the clinical setting, that is home monitoring of blood pressure in adults, uh, which may be used to confirm or identify people with essential hypertension and to differentiate those from uh, people whose blood pressure goes up the minute they walk through the doctor's surgery. It may be glomerular filtration rate, which is a measure of uh, urinary flow through the kidneys. And this is used as a diagnostic biomarker to identify and to stratify the degree of severity of patients with co chronic kidney disease. It can be an ejection fraction. This is a, a, a radiological marker used as a diagnostic biomarker in patients with heart failure which identifies patients with low ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction in uh, such individuals as these patients are treated differently. And in uh, cancer, uh, we are now commonly using gene expression profiling, uh, particularly of uh, tumor uh, tissue, which is used as a diagnostic biomarker to segregate patients with uh, di diffuse large cell B cell lymphoma in subgroups of different tumor cell of origin signatures. And indeed, uh, for solid tumors, this may also be utilized to identify subjects with particular mutations, uh, which um, would uh, require different therapies. Now, a prognostic biomarker is a, a, a marker which identifies the likelihood of a clinical event occurring in the patient over time. And that may be a disease recurrence or a disease progression event in patients who have the disease or the medical condition that is of interest. So examples of these include the breast cancer genes one and two, BRCA1, two mutations, which uh, confer a likelihood of um, a second breast cancer among patients who have been treated for primary breast uh, cancer in the past. Uh, in addition, uh, chromosome 17P deletions and TP53 mutations assess the likelihood of death in patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Increasing prostate-specific antigen, a plasma biomarker, assesses the likelihood of cancer progression after primary treatment in patients with prostate cancer. And similarly, a histological score, the Gleason score, in a tumor sample uh, gives some idea of the likelihood of cancer progression in patients who have been treated for prostate cancer. Plasma fibrinogen has been used to select patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease who are at high risk for exacerbation and or mortality for inclusion into interventional clinical trials. And total kidney volume uh, can select patients who have autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease who are at higher risk for progressive decline in renal function, again, uh, through enrich uh, inclusion into interventional clinical trials with putative treatments. Oops. A safety biomarker, on the other hand, is a marker which is measured before or after an exposure to a medical product or an environmental agent, that is uh, something that is in the atmosphere, to indicate the likelihood or presence or extent of toxicity which may be observed as an adverse effect of exposure to that product or uh, environmental toxin. So examples of these are hepatic enzymes, hepatic aminotransferases, and bilirubin blood tests to evaluate the potential for hepatotoxicity, and serum creatinine, which can monitor for nephrotoxicity. Serum potassium, uh, which can be used to evaluate patients on certain diuretics or on angiotensin enzyme inhibitors uh, 
and receptor blockers or aldosterone antagonists, all of which may increase potassium levels, which can lead, unfortunately, to uh, toxicity and even sudden cardiac death. Uh, urinary kidney biomarkers have been developed over time. Um, several of these exist, uh, uh, KIM-1, uh, albumin, urinary albumin, urinary total protein, beta-2 microglobulin, urinary clusterin, urinary trefoil factor 3, and urinary cystatin C, which can be used both in humans and in animal studies to identify the risk of kidney tumular toxicity. And these were all developed as a result of specific activity to identify uh, toxicity markers that could be utilized both in animal toxicity studies and in human uh, trials. Um, the neutrophil count, uh, full blood count, uh, looking particularly at a subset of the white cells, is commonly used to monitor safety of cytotoxic therapy for cancer. A corrected QT interval, the QTC, assesses the potential for a drug to induce a condition called torsade de poids, which is ventricular dysrhythmia, which can cause sudden cardiac death. And HLAB 1502 allelic screening can pick out patients who are at risk of serious or fatal skin reactions uh, in folks who may be treated with carbamazepine. So a range of uh, safety types, uh, uh, including ECGs, blood tests, and urinary evaluations can be utilized to look at safety in humans and in animal studies. Now, a pharmacodynamic, I'm sorry, I've skipped one. Yes, no, a pharmacodynamic marker is a marker that uh, demonstrates a biological response has occurred in an individual who has been exposed to a product or to an environmental agent. So an example of uh, a biologic response marker might include the measurement or the counting of circulating B lymphocytes in patients with lupus who are taking B lymphocyte inhibitors. Again, if you're treating a patient for hypertension, you would expect to uh, see a, a decline in blood pressure over time as a response to a specific antihypertensive agent or indeed to dietary interventions such as sodium restriction. You can look at serum uh, low density lipoprotein cholesterol to assess response to a lipid lowering agent or to uh, sticking with a dietary activity to reduce hyperlipidemia. Uh, hemoglobin A1c is a good way of looking at a sustained response to antihyperglycemic agents or to diet and lifestyle changes in patients with diabetes. The international normalized ratio is a measure of the clotability of a drug and can it be used to measure a patient's response to warfarin treatment while viral load can be used to evaluate response to either an antiretroviral treatment for HIV or indeed uh, for uh, treatments for uh, hepatitis. Urinary aminoglycans uh, levels uh, evaluate the effect of enzyme replacement therapy for persons with mucopolysaccharidosis type 1. And a standardized uptake value, which is a measure of the uh, internalization of radioactive FDG uh, utilizing positron emission tomography CT, can evaluate response to treatment in patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and indeed has recently been incorporated into the definition of uh, response type. Now, in contrast to a pharmacodynamic marker, which is used to actually assess a biologic reaction to a, a medicine. In order for that, um, uh, you might also be interested in predicting the likelihood of that response. And a predictive biomarker is one that can be both perhaps used to, to look at pharmacodynamic interaction, but also to identify individuals who are more likely to respond or conversely, not to respond to a specific uh, treatment. So, for example, squamous differentiation in non-small cell lung cancer 
uh, identifies subjects that are likely to have a worst outcome following pemetrexate therapy and who would be better off being treated with platinum containing mixtures. Certain cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance uh, regulator mutations uh, are known to, um, and in fact, uh, drugs have been designed specifically to interact with this transmembrane conductance regulator uh, in order to manage cystic fibrosis. And so uh, certain of these agents can only be successfully used in patients with the specific mutation of interest. Once again, breast cancer genes one and two identify breast cancer patients who are more likely to respond to poly-ADP ribose polymerase or PARP inhibitors. While human leukocyte antigen allele 5701 genotype identifies patients who may have severe skin reactions to abacavir. Uh, thiopurine methyltransferase or TPMT genotype or the activity of the enzyme itself uh, can identify persons who sl only slowly metabolize 6-mercaptopurine or azathioprine. And uh, patients who are slow metabolizers of these agents are at particular risk of severe toxicity, which can be avoided if the doses administered are appropriately adjusted to retain efficacy while avoiding the toxicity of concern. So all of these uh, types of approach can be used to predict response to treatment. Ideally, of course, in a clinical trial, you might want your biomarker to do all of the above. Now, in terms of uh, turning a biomarker into a surrogate marker, one needs to consider uh, two uh, approaches. In one um, uh, episode, uh, then a surrogate marker may be thought to be likely, uh, or a biomarker may be thought to be likely to be a surrogate for a clinical outcome if it has a strong mechanistic or epidemiologic rationale such that an effect on the marker is expected to correlate with the clinical benefit. But in this circumstance, it may have insufficient clinical data to truly validate it as a validated surrogate endpoint. Um, now, this does not preclude the use of that marker uh, in order to make decisions during development or indeed for regulatory purpose. But uh, in the condition in which the marker is uh, only reasonably likely to be uh, uh, correlated with the clinical outcome, then uh, it may be used in the circumstances of accelerated approval processes for drugs or devices and under these circumstances must usually be followed by a confirmatory study which documents complete clinical benefit. So one uh, example of that might be um, uh, progression-free survival in a patient with cancer to be followed by a confirmatory study to look at overall cancer survival in that uh, population. In contrast, a, a marker that has been fully validated is a marker that is supported by both a clear mechanistic rationale for its use and where there is clinical data providing strong evidence that an effect on that marker predicts a certain specific clinical benefit. And this can be used to support marketing approval of a medical product in a defined context without the need for additional studies to demonstrate clinical benefit directly. And obviously, therefore, if you were to want to use a surrogate um, marker in that condition, it would be helpful to qualify it completely for use in such a way. So what are examples of these uh, two approaches? Well, in the context of a reasonably likely outcome, um, a six month follow up sputum culture status and infection relapse rate has been used to accelerate approval of drugs used to treat tuberculosis, uh, in particular the multi-drug resistant type, which is becoming more prevalent in certain parts of our world. A decrease in iron stores has been utilized uh, to, um, uh, for patients with iron overload caused by thalassemia has supported accelerated approval of drugs to treat non-transfusion dependent thalassemia. Uh, 
and radiographic evidence of tumor shrinkage, response rate, or progression-free survival, as I mentioned earlier, has supported accelerated approval of drugs to treat uh, cancer types. Uh, biochemical evidence of a clinically significant degree of improvement in alkaline phosphatase at 12 months has supported accelerated approval of a drug that treats adults with primary biliary cirrhosis who have failed prior treatment or who have not been able to tolerate ursa deoxycholic acid, which is the uh, principal, in fact, the only approved so far treatment uh, for biliary cirrhosis. And so uh, all of these um, approaches have been shown to have um, response to treatment. Mechanistically, these are highly likely to be associated with clinical outcome in the sense of uh, tuberculosis, complete freedom from disease, in the sense of uh, primary biliary cirrhosis, reduction in cirrhotic uh, progression and uh, reversal of the cirrhotic process. But uh, a, a complete clinical linkage between the marker and that outcome of interest has not yet been achieved. In contrast, uh, validated surrogate markers include, as mentioned earlier, hemoglobin A1c, which is a surrogate marker for the reduction in risk of microvascular complications, that is loss of eyesight, uh, destruction of the kidney associated with diabetes mellitus. These are, are uh, problems that take a long time to evolve. And by looking at sustained reductions in hemoglobin A1c, it has been demonstrated from cohort studies in the past that the incidence of these microvascular complications is significantly decreased. HIV1 HIV plasma RNA reduction is a validated surrogate for human, human immunodeficiency, HIV, clinical disease control, that is prevention of uh, decline in CD4 count and a uh, reduction in opportunistic infections and indeed a, a, a complete reduction in the frequency of death and is now used as a, the uh, primary outcome for trials of anti-HIV medications. Low density lipoprotein cholesterol reduction is also a validated surrogate for reduction of cardiovascular events in patients with hyperlipidemia. And again, this acceptance was related to uh, natural history uh, studies, which looked at major um, myocardial outcomes and, cardi and stroke in patients with um, hyperlipidemia who were receiving uh, treatment for cholesterol reduction or who successfully controlled their cholesterol levels by dietary means. Blood pressure reduction, we know, is a validated surrogate uh, for reduction in rates of stroke, of myocardial infarction, and of overall mortality in patients with high blood pressure. And serum uric acid reduction is a validated surrogate marker for the improvement of clinical gout. And indeed, normalization of uric acid will completely remove the clinical symptoms of gout in affected individuals. So why would we go to the um, extent of uh, qualifying a biomarker? Well, um, biomarkers are important in drug development because effective use of, of uh, the range of biomarkers available can accelerate and enable drug development, particularly in areas of unmet medical need. Uh, their use can improve trial efficiency and indeed render feasible trials in certain patient types that would otherwise be completely unfeasible. And they can be used to enrich the study po population with uh, uh, individuals at higher probability of an event of interest so that detecting a change in the outcome of the disease with treatment becomes feasible, whereas enrolling all patients with the disease, no matter what, uh, may uh, require studies that are unfeasible at reasonable cost. It is also enables the uh, enrichment of the study population with a patient group that may be more responsive uh, to the drug that is being used in the trial. Biomarkers can also improve monitoring of patients during the trial process. Uh, 
uh, including, as we discussed earlier, earlier detection of drug toxicity, enhancing patient safety. And they can be used to detect changes in patient status uh, which, uh, before these become clinically apparent. And one particularly thinks of the use of uh, CT or MRI or PET-CT in patients with cancer to look at a change in tumor mass over time. It can also approve the assessment of a treatment response and predict eventual clinical benefit. Again, uh, this could be looking at drug sugar control or uh, changes in, in cholesterol in patients in hypertensive and or uh, diabetes and or hyperlipidemia studies, knowing that those are connected to an eventual reduction in complications of those endocrine conditions. So these can, uh, the development of a, of a good biomarker can address an unmet medical need and um, diminish the risk that progress is halted or delayed because you don't have uh, an adequate uh, drug development tool. However, biomarker development is not for the faint-hearted. Many disease areas with unmet needs, unfortunately, have insufficient drug development tools to maximize trial efficiency or even feasibility. And biomarker development is a long and very resource intensive task. Firstly, you need to start with a discovery um, process in order to identify a biomarker of interest in the condition or attach to the target approach that you intend to use. And this requires um, biased and unbiased screenings in animal clinical and epidemiological investigations, including real world evidence type approaches. It uh, is necessary to develop some early animal translational models in which the biomarker of interest can be assessed and to link these with clinical or epidemiological observational studies in which the marker is measured and then can be correlated with an eventual clinical effect. There is no point in developing a biomarker that cannot be accurately measured and an analytic validation effort is required to both ensure the accuracy of the marker itself, to identify the reproducibility of it as a measurement in individuals and to identify the um, a reasonable variation of the measure um, in, in the absence of intervention so that uh, a critical cutoff for uh, therapeutically relevant change in the biomarker from uh, pre-use can be identified. And lastly, but by no means least, uh, some interventional studies are then required using gold standard endpoints, that is often clinical endpoints, compared to uh, the candidate uh, product with multiple different treatments with different mechanisms of action to show that the biomarker itself will work across a drug class and is not uniquely uh, attached to one class. That is particularly important where a biomarker is um, going to be used to make a clinical benefit claim. Now, this is an enormous body of work, and so it goes without saying almost that that requires the collaboration of many different stakeholders. There may be multiple institutions beavering away on biomarkers for disease interest as part of their primary diagnostic and research endeavors. There are often several academic societies uh, linked to the disease area who may have different viewpoints and uh, different types of members that need to align in order to agree on the utility of a marker of interest. Um, drug development is an entirely different process to uh, marker development and device and uh, analytical development. So it requires collaboration between the owners of drugs, the drug company, and the owners of the diagnostic method, which may be a, a diagnostics uh, company, maybe an imaging company, it may be an, uh, an ECG machine company, 
uh, that may be working in that area. And this uh, involves um, companies which have rather different expectations for the performance of the product, may see the use of that product quite differently, depending on whether they are selling the diagnostic or selling a therapeutic, uh, and indeed uh, um, may uh, wish an exclusivity package which is not in the interests of the other party. Um, a diagnostics company is going to make its profit from the diagnostic itself and not from tagging a diagnostic to a drug that may be used in only a portion of patients with the disease. So um, on top of this, there may be very many different patient stakeholder organizations also who have an interest in access and in utilization and in invasiveness of the test method that uh, you are developing. So uh, to say the least, it takes a village uh, to undertake this process. Okay. So turning now to the idea of getting your marker accepted for use in a regulatory environment, um, really, uh, the advice that is given by the Food and Drug Administration and the European uh, authorities is to sit back from the hoi polloi of activity and uh, take a look at what it is you are trying to do with your marker. So what it is that you believe that the development of that marker will address in terms of the unmet drug development requirements and also the medical needs of a patient that could be addressed by its use. You then need to define the context in which you're planning to use the biomarker. Are you going to use it only for decision-making purposes early on in the development program and later in development, you will turn to uh, classical clinical endpoints for clinical trials? Or will you be seeking to use the change in that biomarker as a surrogate for a clinical outcome? And if you are planning to do that, you will need to conduct quite a large program before you even start your clinical development activity to validate the marker as a surrogate for the clinical outcome it's of interest. You need to consider the benefits of uh, the marker within the context of your drug development activity. For example, will it improve your clinical trial efficiency? Uh, will it, and by that I mean, does it mean that you may be able to complete the trial with fewer subjects in a faster period of time? Or uh, will it improve subject safety by detecting an unwanted toxicity of the drug that you plan to use at an earlier time point and thereby enable uh, withdrawal of uh, therapy before uh, outright damage? But conversely, are there um, some risks to the subject if the biomarker is actually not suitable for its in intended use. So for example, um, if you're using your uh, biomarker to reduce the numbers of subjects that you need to conduct a study that uh, would normally have a clinical outcome, you may have a trial that is underpowered to uh, show an appropriate outcome. And this may lead to an inappropriate approval decision. Similarly, if your uh, biomarker is intended to diagnose certain subsets and its performance in diagnosis is poor, you may either have to screen enormous numbers of persons to find a relatively low number of people with the condition, or alternatively, you may miss people with the condition because the marker is not sensitive enough to enable detection of those patients within a large population. So these considerations inform the level of evidence that you need to support the qualification of a biomarker that you will write into a dossier to send to the agency to have a discussion around the markers that you are planning to use in your clinical trials. And the evidence base will include a biological rationale for the marker of interest, 
data that you have generated that support the relationship between the biomarker and the clinical outcome of interest, and data on the analytical performance of the biomarker test method, whatever that is, be it a blood test, a radiological process, an ECG trace, etc. So how will you go around uh, this validation aspect? So firstly, um, you need to have a source of uh, specimens or persons who are going to participate in an investigation of your biomarker test. You need an assay that will measure the marker of interest, be it an electrical trace from the heart, uh, the result of a blood analyte. Um, you may need specific equipment uh, to measure the outcome. Uh, there may be some uh, computer interpretation of uh, the information derived from that equipment. An excellent example of that is the picture or the apparent picture that you get in an MRI or a CT, which is actually a mathematically calculated image, unlike an X-ray, which is a, a photograph of gamma rays passing through an individual. And then lastly, you're going to have to develop some instructions to the persons taking a sample, if a sample is required, or, or making the measurement in the patient, if it is a measurement that you are making, uh, to um, create the data or to collect the information that is relevant to analyzing that particular test outcome. And all of this then leads to a method or criterion for interpretation of the outcome of that uh, test. So um, in the context of a, a blood um, test, what all of these things lead to is uh, validating that the performance characteristics of the test method, be it a blood test, an ECG trace, or an image, are acceptable for the proposed context of use. So if you're going to use a, a PET-CT scan to identify areas of recurrent cancer, then you would need to compare the result of the scan with histological proof that an area identified using the scan is truly positive for that cancer, or alternatively, a negative area is truly negative. You need to be able to demonstrate both in an analytical validation sense. Similarly, for a blood test of some type, you need to be able to show that your test measure measures the analyte of interest and not a whole raft of associated analytes. Uh, for example, that if you're looking for a particular mutation in tumor DNA, that you can identify that reliably and you are not using a technique which identifies um, a range of, of different mutations on different uh, uh, portions of uh, the genome. You also, um, of course, then need to collect a whole series of biomarker measurements in a patient set to qualify for its use in drug development by clinically validating that the correlation that you may have rationally described is in fact true and suitable for the proposed context of use in the development program of interest. So you will have two dossiers in essence. There will be a dossier that is all about the method of analysis and its validation as a standalone test. And then there will be a dossier that links the results of those tests uh, to progression or change in the status of the clinical disease which you're measuring. Now, it is unfortunately the case that correlations do not necessarily mean that a marker will be suitable for use as a surrogate for a clinical outcome. And there are several um, circumstances in which a treatment effect on a biomarker uh, may give you a false readout in terms of uh, a clinical outcome. And an example of that was uh, measuring um, uh, the biomarker of HIV treatment response, CD4 count, in the context of predicting the risk of maternal to child transmission 
of HIV. And another example is measuring a biomarker of uh, a disease process, for example, carcinoembryonic antigen or PSA, uh, to predict the probability of uh, sustained cancer-related symptoms and eventual mortality. In these two cases, the biomarker that was being measured was not actually the critical biomarker that affected the outcome of interest in the context of mother to child transmission of HIV, rather than CD4 count, it's actually circulating HIV viral load that is the relevant uh, risk factor. And in the terms of cancer related symptoms and death, the site and total burden of tumor in the body is the relevant biomarker rather than a measure of uh, the presence of disease. Similarly, um, with uh, thrombolytic agents, there is the question of, uh, uh, in looking at uh, the risk of mortality after a myocardial infarction, there is a question uh, around uh, the extent to which you need to change blood flow in order to alter the 30-day um, cardiac mortality. And you may have an excellent effect on uh, thrombolysis, uh, but it may not improve blood flow sufficiently to enable the heart to recover and for the 30-day uh, mortality rate to be um, reduced. Uh, similarly, interferon gamma is uh, a, a measure of uh, response to therapy for chronic granulomatous disease, but uh, you have to actually kill the bug in order to prevent recurrence uh, of infection uh, and uh, indeed cure of the disease per se. And, in, and these are all examples of uh, false outcomes that were assessed based on a biomarker in clinical trial that eventually um, failed to show clinical benefit. Um, in addition, um, there may be off-target effects of your treatment, uh, which can overwhelm the effects of the treatment on disease per se. So, for example, although anemia is strongly associated with mortality in cancer trials, an increase in hemoglobin, uh, which can be induced by the use of, uh, of um, recombinant erythropoietin, actually increases mortality in cancer patients, uh, which is due to an increased risk of thrombosis in these individuals, as the red cells produced are larger and stickier than uh, red cells uh, produced under natural circumstances. So here was a circumstance in which uh, a perfectly logical association resulted in harm to patients by um, inducing a second uh, fatal outcome. Uh, control of diabetes in terms of reduced glucose and hemoglobin A1c usually reduces the risk of major uh, cardiovascular events. But in trials of rosiglitazone, uh, it was found that use of rosiglitazone was increased with an, was associated with an increased risk of fatal cardiac death, uh, possibly because of the secondary effects, including importantly, the increased rate of hypoglycemia observed in patients treated with rosiglitazone. And recently, in fact, as, as late as last week, a combination of venetoclax, dexamethasone, and bortezomib, which had previously been shown to be superior to standard treatment, which is dexamethasone and bortezomide, bortezomib, in terms of tumor response rate, having a response rate of 82% versus 68% for standard treatment, progression-free survival, which was almost doubled, 22.4 months instead of 11.5 on the standard uh, therapy, and increased the proportion of subjects with uh, minimal residual disease um, from uh, 1 to 13.4 percent. However, unfortunately, in terms of overall survival, the triple combination had lower survival than patients receiving standard therapy. In fact, the mortality was almost double. So this, we don't know the reason for this uh, currently, and it's under investigation. It may relate perhaps to um, an increased risk that recurrence that occurs is explosive in nature and actually cannot then be halted. 
uh, but this outcome um, it was very disappointing uh, uh, in um, multiple myeloma. And uh, again, it may well be related to off-target effects of the uh, treatment of interest. So then, what do we, what must we know in order to turn a biomarker uh, into a surrogate marker for a disease outcome? Well, really, there are four uh, strata of evidence. Firstly, the marker itself must correlate with the disease outcome. The marker must measure effects on the disease pathway that are relevant to the outcome of interest and to not, as discussed earlier, peripheral effects that could be overwhelmed by a different pathway of the disease. The level of effect of, on the marker that is required in order to alter the disease outcome of interest has to be understood and treatment of, it, of that uh, disease doesn't of itself cause additional pathology or adverse effects on other factors which would then affect the outcome of interest itself. So I'm going to um, now discuss how all of those approaches were utilized in the context of the um, qualification of HIV-1 plasma RNA PCR as a surrogate marker for clinical outcome trials in patients with HIV infection. And for those of you much younger than I, um, I'll just remind you of the history of acquired immune deficiency syndrome, which was reported in the West uh, following an initial report of an apparent epidemic of polycystis carinii pneumonia, which is a, a very unusual form of pneumonia caused by an organism that is not normally thought to be pathogenic in uh, uh, normally um, immune uh, sufficient individuals. And um, this was reported in the mortality and morbidity weekly report by the CDC as long ago as 1981. Uh, and uh, in this uh, condition, these five young men were all, uh, the only thing they had in common was the fact that they were men who had sex with men. However, uh, the same condition was later recognized in people who had received blood or blood products. So uh, amongst haemophiliacs who were having uh, blood transfusions and or uh, factor eight um, for the management of bleeding episodes among drug addicts who shared needles and therefore uh, had um, sharing of blood uh, across individuals, and in infants born uh, to um, affected mothers or to mothers who were partners of, of men with haemophilia or uh, drug addicted themselves. Um, two years later, the virus that caused uh, the uh, immune deficiency portion of this syndrome was isolated and recognized as a cause of uh, this cluster of diseases. And it was in 1987 that the uh, first trial of an antiviral agent, which was AZT, took place. Between 1987 and 1996, a multiplicity of companies developed multiple different antiviral therapies and also started combination studies utilizing different antiviral therapies that attack different portions of the virus life cycle. And uh, they collected uh, during the clinical trials, not only clinical outcomes of the disease itself, uh, but also um, uh, a big uh, biobank of uh, sera and um, blood cell um, uh, pellets from patients affected and treated both before and after treatment. In 1996, as we know, highly active antiretroviral therapy uh, came, came into being. Um, these were regimens that contained uh, um, combination treatments and importantly, protease inhibitors and uh, the disease uh, AIDS virtually disappeared provided HIV infection was recognized uh, prior to the first AIDS defining illness in an individual and has spawned uh, since then uh, the testing and prevention regime that is now standard medical practice. 
And just to illustrate that, this is the uh, deaths per thousand, uh, 100,000 population of the United States between 1987 and 1993, which is the start of the first combination studies, and in 1996, when a highly active antiretroviral therapy started to be widely used. And here we have the effect of screening and uh, prevention instituted by early uh, treatment and sustaining of low viral load amongst patients who are HIV affected. So a very uh, successful outcome turning a disease that uh, had an almost, well, a 100% fatality outcome into a manageable chronic condition. Now, at the time that uh, I started work in the HIV area, which is the, the late 80s, uh, we were using peripheral blood CD4 T helper lymphocyte counts as our primary surrogate marker. And uh, we were utilizing these because we knew that there was a correlation of the count in the bloodstream and the nature, frequency, and type of opportunistic infections that occurred in the affected person and indeed the probability that that individual would die. So the critical cutoff uh, actually was 200 CD4 lymphocytes uh, per mil of blood. And uh, under these conditions, um, below that number, uh, patients had um, often uh, episodes of recurrent pneumonia with different organisms. Uh, they may acquire TB. They may express esophageal candidiasis. This is where yeast uh, gets into the esophagus rather than just causing a skin rash or uh, some uh, mouth ulcers. Uh, and a cancer which is caused by a human hominis virus type 3, uh, Kaposi's sarcoma. When the lymphocyte count dropped to 100, uh, patients obviously often were showing evidence of wasting, that is, they were losing weight and losing muscle mass. They um, had uh, a very high risk of, of uh, acquiring pneumocystis uh, carinii pneumonia, now renamed uh, pneumocystis gerovicii. Uh, they may acquire uh, toxoplasmosis um, from uh, the household cat or cryptococcus, which is a common contaminant of drinking water, uh, may cause uh, diarrheal disease or indeed uh, septicemia in these individuals. Below 50, they started to see evidence of, of re, uh, other viral infections, which are normally contained uh, by active uh, immune system, including cytomegalovirus, uh, retinitis, which is a, a disease which untreated will lead to blindness, uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which causes a dementing like illness and, and uh, in the brain, uh, a mycobacterium avium complex, which is an opportunistic form of the tubercular uh, bacillus, which can be acquired from aviary birds. And uh, these individuals also were at high risk of lymphoma. So uh, it seemed quite logical to count the T lymphocyte counts and treat people accordingly with the expectation that if you improved these uh, counts, then all of these conditions would be prevented. At the same time, um, it seemed obvious that uh, the amount of virus that an individual was infected with might be relevant. And there were several ways of measuring that. There was something called P24 antigen. Uh, P24 is a protein that's found on the capsid of the HIV virus. And its quantity in blood was an indirect measure of the amount of virus circulating in the person. And it's already been shown that increasing uh, P24 antigen preceded uh, decline in CD4 count. And more importantly, uh, the P24 antigen measure uh, responded specifically to antiviral medication, whereas CD4 counts sometimes did not. HIV plasma uh, PCR was first used in 1992, but very rapidly, within three years, there were multiple assays available from a range of different companies, all of which had been validated by uh, looking at uh, PCR um, spiking of normal human plasma so that uh, it was known how many copies per mil of plasma could be detected. The lower limits of detection of the method were understood and it happened to be 40 to 80 copies per mil. And uh, within subject variability in the um, 
uh, number of copies in over a short period of time in the absence of treatment uh, was known and it ranged between uh, 0.3 and 0.5 log copies. Um, there were comparisons of methods conducted, um, uh, a, a normal sort of competitive approach by a diagnostic company, and the assays were broadly comparable, which eventually meant that um, data that had utilised different uh, measures of HIV-1 plasma RNA could be pooled together in order to be able to um, uh, validate the surrogacy of the, of the uh, evidence. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, there was many uh, large sample cohorts, both from natural history studies of the condition that were conducted prior to the onset of novel therapies by the National Institutes of Health and the AIDS Clinical Trials Group, and also with um, multiple pharma-sponsored clinical trials with different antiviral agents with different mechanisms of action. And uh, in um, 1996, we all got together and shared our data and conducted a massive meta-analysis uh, in which um, the biomarker samples from all of these trials were pooled together to evaluate uh, both the um, uh, variation that had to be reached, the log copy number that was associated with the change in clinical outcome rate, and to demonstrate that the uh, marker itself was closely correlated with clinical outcome. And as you can see, this involved governmental organizations, many different companies, some of which no longer exist, Pharmacy and Upjohn is now part of Pfizer, uh, and, uh, and several different um, methods of measuring plasma RNA PCR. And what this meta-analysis showed was that as the viral load increased, uh, then the number of clinical events per 100 person years of observation increased. And this was critically a bend in the curve at around 400 uh, copies per ml of plasma. And after that, the incidence of HIV or AIDS-defining illnesses or death from AIDS um, uh, increased uh, very rapidly once you uh, started to get ever-increasing numbers of viral studies. The pooled um, AIDS clinical trial group studies uh, were used to investigate um, the critical minimum uh, uh, load that was uh, reduction that was required to confer this benefit. So if there was a, a round a 0.5 log reduction, then there was about a 50% reduction in the uh, clinical outcome rate. But if you reduced uh, viral load by at least a log or more, uh, then you could reduce um, the frequency of illness almost to zero. Uh, and indeed, if you looked at the uh, value uh, that uh, was associated with this very low number in, um, of uh, progression rates, then the copies per ml were around 400. So that is why uh, treatment um, begins now at that uh, value of virologic response. In addition, it was shown that the longer that you could keep viral load before, below that critical minimum number, uh, the better off people were. So if you could sustain that for at least uh, um, three months, uh, then you had a, around a 50% reduction in likelihood of progression. But if you could keep it below there for at least six months, uh, then uh, you had a 75% reduction in the frequency of uh, progression. So um, that uh, uh, program uh, really pretty much took between 1983 and 1996 to put together. It required a huge uh, collaboration across industry and academia, and it successfully demonstrated that HIV-1 plasma RNA-PCR as a measure of viral load predicted the clinical outcome of treatment and that there was a lower risk of progression with HIV plasma reductions of more than 0.5 logs from the time of starting treatment, uh, and the bigger the reduction, the greater the clinical benefit that sustained reduction was also associated uh, with better benefit, and that suppression of viral load below the limit of detection was associated both with sustained virologic load reductions and also, and very importantly, uh, with lower emergence of resistance to the drugs used to cause the disease. So this serves as a model 
for moving a putative correlated biomarker to become a surrogate marker for disease outcome to improve uh, the efficiency of drug development and is uh, a pathway which can be followed for other biomarkers with other diseases of interest. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Penny. That was a great presentation. And we're now going to take some questions from the audience. So if you have not already done so, please type your questions into the question box for us. I'll just give you a minute or so to submit those questions. Okay, so there's a question here for you, Penny. Uh, if you're starting out now on a development program, what should you be doing to qualify your biomarker? So if you're starting out now with your new um, target agent uh, or you're in drug discovery mode, the first question you should ask yourself is, uh, have I got, do I understand how this product is working, how this marker target works in the disease pathology of interest? And have I got a way to measure that it, utilizing um, a technique which is minimally invasive? So, so at best, a blood test, at worst, uh, a tumor sample from a cancer that's deeply situated in the body. The answer to that is yes. The next question is, how, um, how uh, efficient is my measurement? And as I mentioned before, you need to know something about uh, the quantity of the marker that uh, has to be present before you can even detect it, and the variation of the measurement that you're using to detect the presence or absence of that marker. So you validate the diagnostic uh, product uh, before you start studies. Then the next thing you need to do is to make sure that you've used that marker in any animal pharmacology studies that you conduct with your putative agent so that you can demonstrate that an outcome in those, human, in those animal pharmacology studies is associated with the movement in the marker itself. And then lastly, you will want to go out and do some epidemiological studies of people with that disease who are being treated perhaps by other um, uh, treatments for the disease to see if your marker not only is a marker of response to your drug, but will also correlate with outcomes in patients being treated with other types of, of drug so that you know um, uh, something about its potential for being a surrogate. As I mentioned before, um, when you start your clinical trials, you use your marker, you collect information on the marker, but also on uh, the clinical outcome of interest so that you can compile a, a database over time that enables you to be able to correlate the whole thing together as you move forwards. And that enables you to document uh, the important uh, criteria, which are the, the lower limit of your detection and what that means, the variation in detection and what that means. And lastly, uh, to be able to make some um, statements about the quantitative change in the marker that is relevant in terms of likelihood of outcome using your product. Thank you, Penny. Uh, so it looks like we haven't had any other questions. So uh, I will wrap up now with a couple of words from me. Uh, so we are the BIA uh, with the Trade Association for Innovative Life Sciences in the UK. And if you're not a member and you're interested in joining or just finding out some more information about what we do, please do get in contact or visit our website for more information. You can see it in the bottom hand right of the screen. So this has been episode four in our Bench to Bedside webinar series. Uh, thank you, Penny, so much for joining us today. Uh, and we hope that more of you will join us for our concluding panel session, which will be taking place at the UK Bioscience Forum on the 17th of October. So for more information about that and to register to attend, you can visit our website www.bioindustry.org and our events page. So Penny, thank you again for joining us. It was a fantastic presentation. And thank you also to everyone in the audience who joined us today. Thank you.